from verse 16, Acts chapter 20 and verse 16. Our Father, we pray as we come to the word of God now that you'd uh, open our eyes, that we might behold wondrous things out of this, thy law. We pray, Lord, that uh, that which we hear and learn tonight, we would apply to our lives. Uh, so do uh, speak to us, uh, challenge us in the scriptures tonight, we do pray, and we'll thank and praise you in the precious name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Right, verse 16. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. When they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll stop reading there. Paul had uh, travelled for a, a little bit of the journey um, up to, uh, uh, fr uh, to Assos by, by foot, uh, I think one of the reasons why he, he spent a little bit of time in, in, in just walking, I think it's about a distance of about 20 miles or so, was just so that he could get um, alone with the Lord. He'd been in a busy time of ministry and spend some time with the Lord and uh, prepare himself for the, the work and the meeting, essentially, that he's going to be having with the Ephesian elders. And so we, we read as to how he... Uh, he meets up with them, sails a little bit of the journey with uh, the rest of the disciples, and then comes to Miletus. And then when he's there in Miletus, uh, we see that uh, he, he does a strange thing. He, he sends for the elders of the church. Now, normally what would happen is, is Paul would travel to the church and you know, spend some time ministering to them and having a time of fellowship and, and so on. But, but this is different. He, he's determined to go to Jerusalem. Uh, and I, I guess he must be pressed for time. There's about a three-day journey, three to four-day journey. So he must send word ahead so that the elders of the church come down to him at Miletus. And that would save him three or four days' journey because he wouldn't have to travel back from Ephesus down to the port again. Uh, and then also I suppose that he realizes that the church at Ephesus uh, would really love to spend more time with Paul. And so they would pressurize him to stay longer. And we know that... From what we've seen previously, that there has been a riot in Ephesus, and if there's another riot, well, he's greatly going to be hindered from going to Jerusalem. So he uses some wisdom, and he feels that it's best for the elders of the church to come down uh, and meet with him at Miletus. Uh, and the thing that we read in the rest of the chapter here is essentially, uh, if you like, a sermon that he gives to a group of elders uh, from the church of, of Ephesus. And we, what we should see from this is that this is essentially a group of pastors. Um, that have come down uh, from the church. Uh, we're not really certain as to how big the group was. I guess it would be a considerable amount of people. Maybe there were other different smaller churches within the, the great city of Ephesus as well. Uh, so be that as may, this great company or small company, we don't know, came down to Miletus and Paul uh, delivers uh, a sermon to them, if you like. Uh, I was hoping to be able to get through the whole thing tonight, but of course that's going to be an impossibility. So we're just going to look at a few of the things uh, that he spoke to them of. And so we see in verse 18 and 19, uh, he speaks to them about his frequent persecutions. Look at verse 18 and 19 again. It says that when they came to him, he said unto them, Ye know, from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I had been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the line in wait of the Jews. All the time that Paul had been at Ephesus, his life had been pretty much of an open book. Pe people spent time with Paul. They, they knew the kind of individual that he was. Uh, and he is essentially, he's calling upon the elders from Ephesus to to examine his life, uh, to look back on the kind of impact uh, that he had and the kind of life that he lived 
uh, amongst them. And, and he draws attention to the fact that he was an example to them. And he was an example to them in three quite significant ways. He firstly tells us that he, uh, he, there was a lowly service. He served the Lord with all humility of mind. So Paul wasn't the kind of individual that expected people to wait on him hand and foot. He wasn't the kind of person that felt that he was in the ministry so that he could benefit, so that people could do for him. He recognized that he was in the ministry so that he could do for them. He had come to essentially be their minister. And I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to the epistle of Peter, 1 Peter uh, chapter number 5. And look at verses 1 through to verse 4. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This is a good... Uh, instruction to a person who would be called to lead the church, to be a pastor of the church. Because the pastor of the church has a position that is quite unique, because he's called to shepherd the flock, while at the same, same time being one of the sheep of the flock. So he's a shepherd and a sheep, both uh, at the same time. Uh, and he's called to serve, uh, and he's called to lead, both at the same time as well. But I think that a pastor that is, is too proud to be involved with any kind of lowly service within the church is not following the example of Paul and certainly not following the example of, of our Lord and our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Uh, look if, with me, if you would, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10, and verse 42 to 45. Now, the world says, if you're great, then you've got servants. But Jesus taught us that if we would be great, then we would serve. So look at verse 42 down to verse 45 of Mark 10. Jesus called them to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them, but so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. That's, that's the biblical example of serving. Uh, and then notice as to how uh, in verse number 45, Jesus spoke of himself and said, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So if we would follow the example of Paul, and more specifically that of our Lord, then we should be willing to engage in service, whether it be a lowly service, or whether it be at the forefront of a ministry, it doesn't really matter, just so long as we can serve. And then he also spoke, spoke not only of a, a lowly service, but I like to notice he spoke about the fact that he had a, a godly sorrow. Because he said, serve in the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations. He had frequent tears. There was a godly sorrow that he had. And, and I think that with the Apostle Paul, that when he looked out upon the people that he ministered to, he, he was one that would weep over their sin. When they wept because of sorrow, he would weep alongside of them. When, when he is a faithful sower of the word of God, would do like Psalms 126 says, going forth weeping, bearing precious seed. There was a, a godly sorrow that he had uh, for the people that he ministered to. 
uh, obviously as a pastor I'm very much aware of it, but there is such a burden of care in the ministry that, that many people just fail to realize. That there, are, there are things that are unseen and that are generally unknown by other people, but there is a burden of care for someone that is a pastor of a church. Uh, and with the Apostle Paul, you can just see the, the kind of burden that he had for his people. Uh, and then again in, in verse 31 of the same chapter, chapter 20, he says, uh, watch, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so you can see that he had a, a godly sorrow for the people that he ministered to. And he, he yearned for them and, and he, he wanted to be a blessing and see them live lives that were honoring to God as well. And then he also speaks about the, the patient sufferings that he had because he speaks about the temptations which befell him by the line in wait of the Jews. The, the Jews were always kind of dogging his steps, weren't they? They were always doing what they could to, to hinder and to, to hurt uh, the work of God. And you know what we read of in the book of Acts? It really doesn't even tell us the half of all that Paul suffered. It's really when you, you look in the other epistles that he wrote and you begin to piece together all the different things that he had to endure for the cause of Christ that you begin to see just how much he did suffer persecution for, for God at the hands of his own countrymen. And so we don't always see straight away, you know, like in the context of the book of Acts, it just tells us some of this stuff. But as you read through later of the Bible, you see a great deal more of it. But when, when Paul was speaking to the Ephesian elders, he, he could essentially say, but, but you know this. You know what I, I've had to endure um, at the hands of my own countrymen, the way that I've, I've suffered for the cause of Christ. And then the second thing I would draw to your attention is, is not just the, you know, the, the persecutions that he endured, but um, I want to speak to you a little bit now about Paul's faithful preaching. Look if you would at verse 20 and 21. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, I'd like to just point out uh, three things about what we read here. The first thing I'd like you to notice when you think about Paul's preaching, and we'll see more of this as we go on through the rest of the chapter, but the first thing that I'll draw to your attention is his completeness in his preaching. Because he, he, he says this phrase, he says, I kept back nothing that was profitable. I kept back nothing. Now, now Luke, who was the human penman to write the, 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 the book of Acts, um, was... Uh, a doctor, a medical doctor. And the term that, that is used there is almost like a medical term where you would withhold food from a patient who needs to perhaps, you know, uh, you know, not have anything by mouth, no by mouth type of thing, as you'd see uh, over the bed in the NHS today. My worst fear, no by mouth type of thing. But, you know, Paul, Paul was essentially, what well, Paul was saying of himself that he didn't keep back anything from the people that he ministered to. Just like a, a mother would uh, feed her household and just kind of just put on a wonderful spread, not holding anything back, just giving them a good meal. This is how Paul was when it comes to the, the ministry of the war, word. He said, I kept back nothing from you. Isn't that a great thing? I kept back nothing. You know, sometimes I know that people who have a, a parachurch uh, organization or ministry have to get income somehow. But I'm always amazed at, at where, they'll, where a, a teaching will be presented and it will say it's something like five steps to live a victorious Christian life. Five steps and you'll live victoriously. Send $25 and I'll send you the CD. Isn't that terrible? I think it should be amazing. I've got five steps. Let me tell you. Just listen up. I'll tell you what those five steps are. So I think, you know, Paul, was he wasn't one to say, when the check's in the post, then I'll give you the food from the Word of God. He just said, I kept back nothing. I just gave you everything uh, that you needed. And it's interesting that he said, I kept back nothing. And don't you think that some of the things that he spoke about would have made people squirm in the pew? 
Some of the things they didn't necessarily want to hear, but though they needed to hear it. And sometimes as a pastor, I find myself some, sometimes speaking about a subject that's perhaps a bit unpalatable. But I, I must address it and I must speak of it. And, and one of the advantages of going through books of the Bible is there is no way of sidestepping it. You know, you've just got to deal with it as that text comes up. And you know, as a church, we, we need to hear these things. Because we need all of the counsel of God. It's like having a meal that you know, doesn't have any of the greens in it or no, you know, no vegetables. We need to have stuff whether we like it or not. These are essential for our physical well-being. And there are some spiritual truths that we need to hear whether we want to hear them or not. They, they are essential for us if we would grow in grace. Paul said later in the book of Timothy, he said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. All of it's profitable. And so we need to take the word of God and recognize this is God's word and I need to receive it. And Paul, as he preached and as he taught, he made sure that they had all of the counsel of God. And I do believe that a steady diet in the word of God is something that will keep us from error. Just by plain uh, reading and studying in the word of God systematically, it's something that will keep us from error. Which we, we need to be careful of the temptation of reading and studying only those things that interest us. Because all of us have subjects in the Bible that we can say really do interest us. But if that's all that we study and all that we know, then we will have an unbalanced um, idea of what the Bible teaches. So we need to just kind of go through all of it. And some of the stuff in the Old Testament, I grant you, is difficult reading, difficult to understand, but just read it anyway. And just read it and read it, and, and you'll find that over a period of time, that will begin to make more and more sense to you. But have a steady diet in the Word of God. It's absolutely essential. And as a pastor, I, I, you know, I endeavor to try and give the, the, a Bible education, try and teach and preach all of the counsel of God. And as a church, when if you find that I've got a hobby horse, and that's every Sunday speaking about that hobby horse, I think she'll say to me, Pastor, I don't think that's quite right. You know, we need, we need something more. We need, to, we need to be built up in this most holy faith. It's, it's absolutely essential. Paul kept at nothing. And you know, when you read the pastoral epistles that Paul wrote, you can see that he didn't keep back anything. If, if you look, for instance, at the, the book of Ephesians. Now, the book of Ephesians is a tremendous study. But in the book of Ephesians, he takes you through such tremendous details about the walk of the Christian life, the, the wealth that we have in Christ, the warfare that we fight. He, he, he takes us to wonderful heights and, and takes us to depths that we would think are unfathomable. But he helps us so that we can grow in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. So he makes sure that uh, he didn't keep back anything from them. Uh, look at verse 32 of the same chapter. <coughs> he says, uh, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. And that's just what the word of God does for us. It builds us up. It kind of it gives us the muscle, spiritual muscle that we need as we go through life's journey. We need to be built up. So we see the completeness in the way that he delivered the message. He kept back nothing. And then I'm not going to notice the compulsion of it. Because Paul didn't think to himself, well, I'll just address a certain group of people that I perhaps get along with. He saw absolutely everybody as a mission field. Whether it was a, a, an older person or a younger person. Uh, whether it was a rich person or a poor person. Whether it was a person who was a Jew or a Gentile made no difference. He saw them all as people for whom Christ died. And he made it his business to give them the gospel. And those that were saved to see them built up in the faith. So there was a compulsion to get the message out. And then lastly tonight. I'd like you to notice that there was a clearness. Notice if you would, in verse 21, he says, testifying 
both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. The clearness of it. Now years ago, it feels like a lifetime, I guess it was, but when I was in the army, so that would be uh, the army 1984, 1985. A long time before you were born, Jacob. But uh, when I was in the army, and, and I really, I wasn't really walking with the Lord. I wasn't as close to Him as what I should be. I was saved, but I was really in a backslidden state. But the army had a, uh, like a state recognized church, if you like. At, at that time, it was the, uh, the Dutch Reformed Church, or the Here Church. And the person that was what we would term today like the vicar of a church, you would call that person a duomini. And so there was a, the duomini was a, like a, a chaplain within, within, our, uh, our, our, um, within our company. And the chaplain had the, all the same rank as a, as a colonel. I don't know if it's the same as what it is here, but the chaplain's rank was the same as a colonel's rank. But I'm kind of digressing. But uh, he, this guy was, I don't, I don't even think he was saved. But, you know, he would try and be all things to all people. And we would, be, we would have to go to the church services. And he, seemed to, he was preaching Afrikaans, so now that would be a bit more difficult for me to, to kind of understand. And so you can well imagine that oftentimes it was just really a, a, a real struggle. But essentially sometimes what it would be like would, would be something like this. The message would be, you people are, are in the desert. And there's no water anywhere in the desert. And you're thirsty. So you, you, that's the kind of thing. You, know, you wouldn't say it in those kind of terms, but spiritually speaking. You know, we, we're, we, we're far from God, and, and we're desperate for God type of things. And, and you're thirsty. Uh, and then you would leave it at that. <laughs> and so you go away thirsty. You think, man, tell me where to get the water. But essentially, there, was, there wasn't a completeness in the way that they would bring the message. And I guess because he didn't have the answer. He knew the problem, but he didn't know the Savior, so he couldn't tell us where to get the water from. But Paul was quite clear. I don't think people came into the contact of Paul and then thought to themselves, yeah, I see that I'm a sinner, and I know that there's a hell to shun, and that there's a heaven to gain, but I don't know how to get there. I think people were quite convinced after meeting with Paul just how they could be saved. And he says in verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. And notice this, this latter part of the phrase, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to just speak to you a little bit about this particular phrase, particularly the word repentance. Repentance is a word generally today that uh, makes people feel uncomfortable. The sinner that is caught up in his sin doesn't want to hear that he's a sinner, doesn't want to hear that he needs to turn from sin and turn in faith to God, doesn't want to, doesn't want to hear about that type of a thing. And then of late, there's, there's come more of an idea that repentance is a kind of a work that is performed, adding works to salvation, and so shouldn't be taught either. So the sinner doesn't want to hear it, and some preachers are loath to proclaim the fact that people need to repent. And then there are those that would talk about faith and repentance. And then they try and dissect this aspect of salvation. So what comes first? Is it faith that comes first? Or is it repentance that comes first? Now, I think that's an impossible question. I think it's particularly impossible for us to answer. Because faith and repentance really are different sides of the same coin. And I don't think you can remove repentance... And, and leave a person with salvation, and I don't think you can remove faith and leave a person with salvation. And, and the verse is quite clear. Paul's message was repentance towards God and faith towards the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is a school of thought nowadays where uh, it is thought that repentance should not be preached because it is considered to be a work of that a person has to perform in order to be saved. Now, if repentance, I, I would agree, if repentance is a work that has to be performed, then I would disagree with it, because I don't see repentance as a work. 
And I don't believe, because no, the years of misunderstanding that people have, the misunderstanding is, is that people think that repentance means that you turn from sin or you stop sinning. This is the idea that a person has about repentance. The fact is, none of us can ever get to a place where we will stop sinning because we have a sinful nature. So I, I don't believe that you can add works to salvation. And like we spoke at length on Sunday, you, you know, if it's of works, then it's not of faith. And if it's of faith only, then it can't include works. It, salvation is by, by grace through faith. It doesn't include any kind of works at all. But as I said, the, the idea that some people have is that salvation means to stop sinning. But I just want to speak to you a little bit about that now. Because I, I think when you, when you read about repentance in the Bible, the first thing that you'll be quite surprised about is that the individual that repentance is mostly spoken of. Now, I haven't counted it. Maybe I should actually do that exercise and count every single time where repentance is used in connection with this individual. But I, I think that repentance is used with this individual more than anyone else. Now perhaps you're thinking, who is this wicked individual that repentance is spoken about so much? Is it someone uh, like uh, Ahab, Ahab in the Old Testament, some wicked individual like him? He should, he had certainly a lot to, to repent for. Is it someone like Paul in the New Testament who was, you know, the chiefest of sinners? Who could it be? Now you're thinking, who is it? <laughs> Now, if this was a, you know, if I was going to make a, a big deal of this, I'd say, well, you come back next week and I'll tell you. And then you can be sure to you. But I'll tell you. The person, or the individual, that repentance is mostly spoken of is actually God. Would you believe that? That God is the one whom, when you read the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, you'll find that repentance is spoken of with God mainly. Let me give you a few verses. I'll just read them to you. We don't need to turn to each one. And these are just for a handful out of a whole a great deal. Genesis chapter 6. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Exodus 32, 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Jonah chapter 3. God saw their works, and they t that they turned from the evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. In Psalms 106, verse 43 and 44, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with the counsel. They were brought low with their iniquity. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered them for his covenant and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Many times, many times in the Old Testament, you'll read where the Bible says that God repented. Now, of course, God doesn't repent of sin. Because the Bible says of God, in him is light and there is no darkness at all. God has no sin from which to repent from. So, it, it, the reason why I'm saying this tonight is because many people equate repentance to turning from sin. That's how they would define it. But here's the definition that I think helps us to understand what repentance really is. Repentance is a change of mind with a change of action. It's a change of mind with a change of action. And repentance is one of those words that can be used in the sense, which, particularly in relation to God, where it says of God repenting, God's not repenting of any evil, but it talks about God having a change of mind about, he was, about what he was going to do, and there's a change of action in relation to that change of mind. And generally, it has to do with the fact that, you know, the people have been called upon to turn from their wicked ways, get right with God, or judgment is coming, and they turn and they get right with God, and the judgment is withheld. So repentance doesn't always equate to a person turning from wicked ways. Now, I do give you that when repentance is used in relation to, um, to man, generally, repentance has to do with um, 
a turning from uh, sin or a different attitude towards sin. And I think the only, perhaps I'll just clarify, that I think the only verse I could think of where it doesn't talk about sin in that sense is perhaps in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 where it talks about how the Corinthian church got right with God and their repentance, we use the word revenge, so I'd have to relook at that. But, but, gen, but be that as may, generally speaking, repentance is used in relation to man as where there is a change of mind as to how they look at sin and there's a change of action because of their change of mind. I don't want you to think that I'm laboring the point necessarily, but let's just think about this when you come to the New Testament. You come to the New Testament and we, we come uh, face to face with an individual who is like a, a man out of the Old Testament, John the Baptist. And you know what John the Baptist's message was always consistently? It was a message of repentance that people would turn uh, from their wicked ways. Now, he's not saying stop sinning. He's essentially calling upon them to have a change of mind and a change of action. Repent, he's telling them. And he's the forerunner for the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, would you believe that his message is quite similar? He tells them at the very beginning of his ministry that he says, repent and believe the gospel. And you know, you, get, you meet up with the Lord again halfway through his ministry and his message hasn't changed. You look at Luke chapter 13, he says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And at the very end of his earthly ministry, just before he goes up into heaven and he gives the commission to his disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. But it doesn't stop there. You know, when you go to the very last book of the Bible, you go to the book of Revelation, and you see the message that Christ has to the, the seven churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3. And to all of those seven churches, except the Philadelphian church, the command is given, repent. So repentance is most definitely a biblical doctrine. It is a change of mind with a change of action. And Paul uh, was a man that preached this. And of course, when you, you go forward in the New Testament as well, you see men like Peter and Paul, and you read about John, uh, again, who most definitely believed in the doctrine of repentance. So when Paul preached, he confronted people with the claims of Christ. And when Paul preached, he showed them the necessity of having repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. You think about it, when you give the gospel to somebody, and of course the gospel in a nutshell is the death, burial and resurrection, but in your discussions you have to be speaking about God and about God's holiness. And isn't part of what you're trying to do is to get a person to realize who God is and who they are? And I think that really when a person has an understanding who God is and sees God for all his glory and he looks at himself and he recognizes his wickedness, there's going to be a change of mind and a change of action. There's a change of mind towards how they viewed God and there's a change of mind as to how they viewed themselves. The sinner left himself says, it's not such a bad thing. I'm not nearly as bad as my neighbor. But when we're confronted with God, we recognize just how wicked we are. Look, if you would, in the book of Luke, chapter 18. I think here's a good example of someone who exercises Biblical repentance and someone who knows nothing about repentance. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. <clears throat> and he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee and the other a publican. 
And the, the Pharisee student prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift some up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Can you see that? The one man, you know, he believed in God, but his prayer was self-righteous. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people are. I'm a good man. I, I, I do the very best I can. I'm not like this wicked man of the side here. And this publican, he couldn't as much as look up to God. He is a man who, who recognized what he was when he considered who God was. The, the term repentance isn't used, but can you see there's a change of mind and a change of action? With, with the patriarch Job, and now one of the complaints made against Job was that he was somewhat self-righteous. He was a good man, but perhaps a self-righteous individual. But he, he made his defense for God. But you read at the end of the book of Job, when, when God speaks out of the whirlwind to Job, and, and, and Job comes face to face with God, Job says this, he said, I heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but he says, now my eyes see thee. And he says, wherefore, I abhor myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. I think that when we see God for who he is, then, and we realize who we are, we, we, there is repentance. There's a change of mind or a change of heart and there's a change of action. And you think about this phrase here, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we see quite clearly that there needs to be a change of mind and a change of action here because how we view God when we come face to face with God, it must result in a change of mind. Our sin has always been toward, towards him. We've always violated his holy laws. So there has to be repentance towards God because we've trodden underfoot everything that he has held and, and uh, deemed holy and righteous. Uh, and so there must be a repentance towards God. And at the same time, there's this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that repentance and faith are really two sides of the same coin that brings about this wonderful gift of salvation. Is it a work? Most definitely not. It is really, it's a change of mind and a change of action. There are many aspects that take place when a person is born again that I think that are, you know, that are unseen by human eye, but God's Holy Spirit so works in an individual's life that they recognize their sin, they see that they've sinned against God, they see that faith must be exercised in Christ, and that person cannot but have repentance, change of mind, and a change of action, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the kind of message that Paul preached. So he speaks about his frequent persecutions, he speaks about his sorrow, and his uh, service, and his persecution, and then we see his preaching. It's completeness and the compulsion and its clearness. So he was most definitely faithful in the preaching of God's word, and we're thankful for that. And so I trust that this has helped you tonight, and I trust it's been a blessing and, a, and a, an encouragement to you uh, in your walk with the Lord. So we'll stop there. Amen. Father, we just uh, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what we hear and learn. And I just pray now that uh, we would recognize the... the the importance of being faithful in our service to you, Lord, whether we be an under-shepherd or whether we be a, a deacon or a member, I pray that each one of us would serve you faithfully. And as we have the opportunity, Lord, will help us to be faithful in our gospel presentation in pointing lost men and women uh, so that they might exercise uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance towards a thrice holy God. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Right, we're going to just uh, have a, a few prayer requests. Oh. Um.
Yeah. And uh, Let's get him up again. 